First John, we are in the fourth chapter, First John chapter four. And again tonight, instead of uh, doing review, I'm just going to jump right in because John really does kind of uh, circle the field. He, he's going to go over some of the same subjects that he's gone over. In fact, uh, uh, I, I think uh, some of the verses we're going to be looking at tonight will take us clear back to the first chapter and remind us of the way John started this letter. So let's just go ahead and jump in here. I believe we left off around verse 15, 16 in the fourth chapter. Uh, verse 15 says, If anyone acknowledges Jesus as the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. This, this gives me an opportunity to say something, if, uh, especially in John, but you never want to do this any place in the Bible. You never just want to pull a verse out uh, without looking at the context. And especially in the Gospel of John, he's going to say things like, it, it, it'll sound so familiar, uh, anyone uh, uh, who uh, uh, believes in the name of Jesus, they're saved, they're, they're our brothers. And it's kind of like, okay, some people will quote a verse like that or a verse like this, anyone who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them. So it's kind of like, hey, well, I acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God, that must mean I'm saved. That's not what it's talking about. Uh, you've got to look at the bigger context here, and John's going to give several different indicators so we can look at our own lives. This is, this, this is very much a section where not what must I do to be saved, but how can I tell that I really do have that kind of relationship with God? So there are several indicators that he's going to point to, but the one that he points to here is just part of a bigger picture, but the one that he points to is acknowledging uh, what's another word for acknowledging Jesus? What, what's a biblical word for acknowledging? Confess. Confess. Um, uh, I'm sure we've talked about this before, but, but, but let me, let, let, let's review it again anyway. The early church, the church fathers, we have some really interesting information on confession. And, and I always think about this when I run across a, a verse like this. In the early church, if you said you believe that Jesus really was the Son of God, you want Him to be Lord of your life, and you said that, especially if you wanted to become a Christian, and the part of becoming a Christian is acknowledging Him as Lord. Remember uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you must confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord. Well, in the early church, here's the way that lived out. If you said that, the early church, we have documents that, that, that indicate that they would say, okay, we, we hear what you say, but where do you work? Where do you live? And they'll follow you to work the next day. You know, maybe on Sunday you say you want Jesus to be Lord. Where do you work? I work at the lumber yard outside of town. Okay, we'll be there in the morning. <laughs> you know, so a lot of representatives from the church go out and follow you to where you work. And, and this is where you work? Yeah. These are the people you work with? Yeah. Okay, what you told us yesterday about you really believing in Jesus. You want to be Lord? Of, tell them. Right? And so here are people from the church literally putting you on the spot in front of people who know you in your community or where you work. And, you know, you get up on a stump if you're in a lumber yard, I guess, whatever. <laughs> but you get in a place where, you know, people can hear you. And it's kind of like, hey, guys, you, you all know me. Uh, you may not know me really well, but I've been, I've been fellowshipping. I've been, I've been going to this Bible study. And you know what? I really believe this. And I, I want to change my life. And I hope you notice a difference in my life. And the people from the church would kind of sit there and listen to this and say, I think he really means it. But, but do you get the point? You know, anybody can say it in certain contexts. It's, it's kind of easy. It's not so easy to say it all the time. The word confess literally means, the, the biblical word confess literally means, say it again. Say it again. And, and I know the idea is, let it come out your mouth what you already believe, what you already know. But there is this idea of redundancy. In other words, if you really believe it, saying it once, that's not really a confession. Not in the biblical sense of the word. It's something that you just naturally say. You say it again. You say it again. It's part of your life, right? Well, that's the concept here. He says, you want to look at your life? Hey, do you really think you're committed? Here's, here's another self-test. Are you the kind of person who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God? If you are, then God lives in a person like that. That's, that's one of the indicators. It makes me think of uh, I, I know this is a goofy old story, but uh, I remember Noble Tribble told, about, uh, told a story about a guy who was, uh, I, I don't remember much of the details, but he was going to be away for the summer. It was going to be a difficult situation, and his family was really concerned about him because, because, you know, being a Christian in this tough environment 
all this stuff. It thought he'd get persecuted and everything. When he came home, you know, was it tough? Did they pick on you before? Because you were a Christian. He says, oh no, nobody picked on me. They never found out. <laughs> well, that's the opposite of what we're talking about here, right? Okay. Uh, always confessing. Verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Okay. There are a lot of things that God is. What's one of the things that John has already focused on the very first chapter? God is what? Do you remember this very first chapter? He kind of starts off the first chapter of 1 John the way he does the Gospel of John. Uh, he talks about Jesus as the Word, but then he shifts to another metaphor. Do you remember what that one is? Light. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Right? Um, um, what does light represent? When you talk about light, but the biblical picture of walking in the light versus walking in the darkness, that's, that's what he starts off with in the first chapter. What does that mean? Truth, truth. Yeah, truth versus falsehood. Right versus wrong. Okay, right is the same as truth. It's, it, it comes from God. Okay, so God is light. God is also love. This is an expression of who God is. Well, why is it that we're not supposed to lie? God, yeah, yeah, it's not that God doesn't like lying. God cannot lie because it's an expression of his nature. Right? God is light. In him is no darkness at all. No falsehood at all. Right? If you lie, your father is... Who's the father of all lies? Yeah, remember Jesus said that in John 8. Okay, so God is truth. God cannot lie. Therefore, we're supposed to tell the truth. When the Bible says God is love, it flows from that that we're supposed to be a people known by love. Why? Not, to, not because God likes it. I mean, grant me some space here. I know he likes it. Right? <laughs> but, but, the, but the primary reason is not that he likes that or he chooses that. That's who he is. Remember the old uh, 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 distinction we made between uh, flavor of ice cream or the music you listen to versus having lungs in your body? Uh, you know, one's a preference, the other's your nature. Uh, uh, things like telling the truth, loving, loving, forgiving, things like that. Those are not preferences for God. Those are part of God's nature. It's who he is. That's why it should mean uh, so much to us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. And God in them. Okay, can can, can I just repeat this? <laughs> uh, the, the point we made a little while ago. If somebody just pulled that part of that verse out, whoever lives in love lives in God. Well, if if I'm a loving person, then that means I have a relationship with God, right? No, no, that's part of the picture. Uh, 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 he just got through talking about uh, confessing Jesus. He's going to talk. He's going to spend a lot of time talking about keeping God's commands. Right, do, doing what God says to do. But part of this picture is being a loving, being a loving person. Give me a definition of love again. What is the agape kind of love the Bible talks about? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, commitment, doing a commitment to do what is best for the person person that you love. God is love. Uh, uh, whoever lo is, whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how we know. This is how, I'm sorry, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Let's, let's get one more verse here before we make comments. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Okay. Perfect love, he, he's talking about the context of love here. God is love, therefore we should be loving people. But he says, uh, one, of the, one of the ways you can tell you've got this kind of love that we're talking about is no fear of punishment. What kind of punishment is he talking about in particular? He's talking about, verse 17, the day of judgment. Why is it that you and I don't fear the day of judgment? And I'm, I'm hoping we're all on the same page here, right? We are saved. Yeah, yeah. We don't fear the day of judgment because we are saved. We know we are saved. How do we know we are saved? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. By the way, what prompted Jesus to do what he did for us? Let's use the word love. Does this make sense? Perfect love casts out. Why? Because God's love for us, that's 
because God had the perfect love and what he did with Jesus, you and I don't have to fear. Since we know we have that loving relationship, we don't have to fear judgment day. Uh, flip over to Hebrews chapter 2 for just a second. Hebrews chapter 2, this is a, uh, kind of a classic uh, verse here. Hebrews, the second chapter, towards the end of that chapter. I want to pick up reading here in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death we, he might destroy. He who holds the power of death, that is the devil, right? So in Jesus' death, he, he defeated Satan. But look at the very next verse. Satan not only has death, what does he say in verse 15? And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by what? Scared to death to die. Fear of death. Why does the fear of death have such a grip on people? Which people? Who is it that has, that experiences this fear of death? Okay, and who doesn't have hope? Yeah, no Jesus, no hope, right? Uh, uh, you ought to be afraid to die. And uh, because of what the Bible says here, you know, I've seen this a bunch in a lot of different ways. You probably have too. But my hunch is, even the people who don't admit it, if you, if you don't have Jesus in your life, there is at the core of your being a, a fear of death. Well, John is taking the positive side here, saying the exact opposite. Saying the same thing, but he's approaching it from this idea, since God did what he did in Jesus, since he loves us that much, wow, that drives out all fear. Uh, so we've got confidence in the day of judgment, right? Okay, <clears throat> he, he's going to continue this. By the way, is there a place, is there a place for fear? in the Christian message? Yeah, I, I agree. When, when, in, what, in what respect is it okay for people to be afraid? Okay, okay, okay. When you talk about the fear of the Lord, uh, uh, that's really interesting. The fear of the Lord, does that involve being scared to death? Maybe a little bit. Primarily, when you think about the fear of the Lord, what are you thinking about? Judgment. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea of fear in the sense of respect, but as far as this idea of, of just fear uh, gripping you, not wanting to do that which is wrong, the, the Bible also endorses that a little bit too. In fact, uh, you, you tell me, remember the story Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25? He says there's a, uh, there's a guy who's going away on a business trip. He's going to be gone for a long time. He brings in three servants. He gives the first one five large sums of money. Second one, how much? Two large sums. Last one, one. Uh, when he comes back, undisclosed time later, he comes back. You know, they're supposed to invest, take care of this money. The guy who had five, how many more did he have? Five, five more. The guy who had two? Two. Okay, we get down to the point. <laughs> Finally to the point of the story. <laughs> Which, by the way, is not. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of teaching <laughs> with the, that other part. But anyway, the, the guy who had one, it, the master comes to him and, and, and asks him to give an account. What did he do? He did it. Why? He was afraid of. He was afraid, and what did the master, remember he said, I knew what kind of master you were, you know, you reap where you did not sow, which by the way, if this picture is God, is that a fair assessment of God? No. He is inaccurate in what he says. He's not right. But what does the master say to the guy with one, with one talent? If you, one, had, one, if you had that fear, why didn't you take it and at least put it in the bank? Do you, yeah, if this represents God or, or Jesus in the relationship to us and being prepared to meet him, which, which I think that's exactly why Jesus is telling the story, what's one of the points he's making here? Isn't God saying, listen, I'd much rather have you do things for a better reason, but if, if you're not going to rise to that level... If all you're going to operate is on the level of fear, well, at least let fear motivate you to do something right. Uh, um, okay. Uh, I think that endorses the idea that it's okay to have a little bit of fear at a certain level. In the book of Acts, uh, we have the missionary journeys. And the missionary journeys, when Paul would go and preach at different places, frequently... Frequently, what would Paul talk about, especially when he talks to a Gentile audience? He, he, he wants to tell everybody about Jesus, and he would do that. 
But almost as frequently as he's telling them about Jesus, you know what else he focuses on when he talks to Gentiles? Judgment day. Judgment. Okay, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna go and talk to people and tell them there's a judgment day, if you don't have Jesus in uh, to make you right with God, what's gonna happen to you? Y yeah, a fearful expectation. The Bible would say, right? Uh, of oh boy, use some very graphic terms there. Okay, if you tell somebody that you're going to uh, uh, suffer torment in a lake of fire forever and ever where the devouring worms never die, what, what kind of emotion do you think that might engender in the part of the... <laughs> Why talk about that sort of stuff and get people afraid? What, what kind of response did he want them to get? To look at what he may need to do to not get to that place. Yeah, you know what? There's a bunch of there's a bunch of different emotions and stuff like that. But you know what? Fear sometimes is a, can be a powerful motivator. Yeah. Now, uh, is that violating what he says here? No, no, because he's talking about the Christians saying, "Hey, don't have this fear anymore because you're saved. You've made it past." That. By way of implication, then the person who's not a Christian. You better be afraid. But there's also a fear that you not lose what you have. Why we, you know. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about that some more tonight, too. Uh, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to shelf that for a little bit later, but that's a very good point. Uh, there's, there's one other factor here, and I don't, I don't want to stretch this too much, but uh, in John, the 16th chapter, the 8th verse, it says, uh, talking about the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to convict the world of, in regard to what? Convict the world in regard to what? Guilt in regard, yeah. Convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Yeah, so part of the work of God's Spirit is to make, can I say it this way? Scare people. I mean, there's more to it than that. But uh, uh, once you have this relationship with God, then the fear is gone. But there is, there is a place for this, and we'll pick up on what Greg said in a little bit, too. Okay, um, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims, let's take a chunk here, then we'll comment on it. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Well, has he said this before? Uh, he keeps coming back to this theme. Uh, if you say you love God, then you better have a good relationship. Remember, remember how we described this before? We're going to come back to this pathway idea. Uh, you're, you're, you're never stagnant. You're moving one direction or another. Either you're going closer to God or you're, or you're going away from Him. You're moving, right? But if you're moving closer to God, you are automatically going to be drawn to other people who are moving in that same direction, aren't you? Okay, now, now look at this. He said, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. By the way, who's he lying to? <laughs> he's lying to himself. He's lying to everybody, right? Uh, this reminds me of chapter 2. Anybody who says, claims that they have no sin, you're a liar, right? You're lying to yourself. You're lying to the world. Okay, okay. Uh, you claim to love God, but you hate your brother or sister, you're a liar. Whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Okay, it, it, I, don't, I don't know if this works for you or not, but, but, but let's go to another Bible story to try to illustrate this, okay? Over in Mark, the second chapter, the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 2, Jesus is at Capernaum. It, early on in his ministry, it, here he is at Capernaum, the crowds, right? He's drawing the crowds. He's in a house, and some people have a friend who's lame. They can't get in the house, so what do they do? Climb up on the roof, knock a hole in the roof, four friends lower the guy. Remember the story? So I'm sure when the, you know, when the debris is falling on them, it gets everybody's attention. And I'm, I'm really sure that when a guy starts to be lowered in the middle of the midst, you know, it, Everybody's attention there because Jesus draws his attention to this guy, right? He looks at this man. Do you remember this story? He looks at this man who's lame, and what does he say to him? Your sins are forgiven. Yeah. He knew what the real problem was here. He said, your sins are forgiven. What was everybody thinking? You can't forgive 
Pharisees. Yeah, there were Pharisees there, and there were some religious people there, and they were saying, hey, he can't forgive sins because only God can do that. Okay? It said Jesus knew what they were thinking, right? And knowing what they're thinking, what does Jesus say next to the guy who's lame? In order that you might know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he turns to the guy and says, take up your mat and walk. So here's a guy who couldn't walk, and he picks up his mat and he walks. Okay, why did Jesus do that? There's so much more to the story. Again, I just want to focus on this one part. Why does he tell him to take up his mat and walk? Because he can show that his sins have been forgiven by him. Yeah, there's an ex external, outward, physical thing that everybody can look at and know that Jesus was able to do this stuff that you couldn't see. Because you can't tell on the outside, right? It's a spiritual thing. You can't tell if you really have the ability to forgive sins. So Jesus is saying, okay, you know, you don't believe I can really... Let me give you proof, something you can see. Do you realize that's exactly what John's doing here? John's saying, how do I know that I, you really have a relationship with God? You know, you can fool everybody. You can fool yourself. You can lie to yourself, Right? That's something you can't see. So let's focus on something you can see. And by proof of this, we'll see if you really love God. What is it that you can see? Well, how are you doing with your brothers and sisters in Christ? By the way, uh, we'll get to this later on, and if I don't, please remind me. We are talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a special relationship in the, in the family of God, right? Um, I know sometimes people talk about the brotherhood of mankind, and there is, it's possible to use that, that term in a broad sense. Most of the time, the Bible is not using it in a broad sense there. We are brothers and sisters in Christ because we've brought, been brought into the same family, right? How, how do we know we've been brought into that family? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. How do I know I'm part of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, I know I'm part of the body of Christ because I have been baptized into the body of Christ. That's what it says. Okay, let me give you one more. I, I know I... Uh, you're thinking, oh, okay, Mark, you're hitting your subject again here. But, but I'm telling you, this is just Bible. What is, it, what is Galatians? I, what is Galatians chapter 3, the last two verses, last three verses, 27 through 29? What does it say? How do you know that you're part of Abraham's inheritance? How do you know you're part of that family? How do you know you get to inherit that? What makes you part of Abraham's family? True descendants of Abraham. It says, all of those of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We're all Abraham's descendants. Who? Those of us who've been baptized into Christ put on Christ. Right? Okay. Uh, we are talking about that kind of love within the family of God. Of course we're supposed to love the world. We're supposed to love our enemies. But there's supposed to be this special kind of relationship in the body. Okay? And it's again another one of the indicators I ought to be able to look at to tell something I can't see. What, how I'm really doing in my relationship with God. By looking at how I'm doing my relationship with my brothers and sisters. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I've just got to add this. The, the word agape means doing what is best for the person, right? It, it, it's, it's a commitment to do what is best for them. Does that mean that they're always going to like it? Right. Think, think, think of parent-child relationships, <laughs> right? Parent-child relationships, you really, you love your child so much, sometimes you'll whip them, right? Tough love. Right? Tough love. Tough love. Okay, I, I, I think that's important to get out there because uh, uh, it doesn't mean we're going to have warm fuzzies all the time. It doesn't mean everything's going to be chipper all the time. But it does mean that there is a strong commitment to, uh, uh, to do what is best. In fact, we're going to see a good example of that here in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse uh, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, what does Christ mean? The anointed one, the Messiah, okay, mm -hmm. fulfilling all those prophes, uh, promises. Everyone who believes, it, everyone who believes that Jesus is that Messiah, the Christ, is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves this child as well. God the Father, God the Son, 
This is how we know that we love the children of God. Okay, we're talking about all of us. We're still talking about this love for our brothers and sisters, right? This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Carrying out his commands. I, I, I don't think he's just repeating himself. I think he's reminding us to really love our brothers and sisters. We do that by loving God. Can, can I say it this way? Have, have you ever have, have you ever had an experience where it's, where you know you need to do something you just don't want to do but you know that God really wants you to do it you know what I'm saying right and especially when it when it concerns interpersonal relationships so sometimes you know relationships can be some of the most rewarding things in the world it can be some of the most painful things in the world. nobody can hurt you like your family right the, the people that are closest to you because you have those kind of relationships, right? Okay, have you, have you ever, could you ever say, you know what, I did it for them, but really I did it for God. <laughs> you know, my heart wasn't really in it, but my heart was, I really want to please God. Now, I think this is a reminder here. Yes, we're supposed to have our uh, uh, love for one another, and one of the things that will motivate us is because we love God so much. And so we're carrying out His commands. So it, it, we're not just... We're not just loving people by doing what we think's best. We're not just doing stuff that we think they're gonna like. We're doing, we're committed to doing what God says. So keeping his commands, that's the commitment we've got. Verse three, in fact, this, uh, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. Uh, why is he repeating himself? Must be pretty important. Okay, so, so don't tell me, oh, I was really trying to help that person. If you're doing something God says not to do. Okay, so we keep his commands. And his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, here's, here's my illustration. His commandments are not burdensome. Who do I want to pick? I want to pick on Fred. I want to pick on Fred. Let's say, sorry, Fred. <laughs> Let's say that, uh, that uh, um, Seth is, uh, for some unknown reason, his truck breaks down at, uh, no, I can't pick on Seth. i got to pick on, uh, let, let's say Emily. Everybody knows Emily, right? Okay, let's say Emily's broken down 2 o'clock in the morning out of 995. I have no idea what in the world she was doing out there at 2 o'clock in the morning. But let's say she's out there at 2 o'clock in the morning, I-95, right? Yeah. And this is why I had to change from Seth to Emily. She's scared. I, I don't think Seth would be scared at 2 o'clock. But anyway, let's say Emily's out there at 2 o'clock in the morning. She's broken down on the highway, and she doesn't know what to do. She's scared, uh, you know, she's frightened for people to come by. And first number on her phone, she sees is Fred's. So she calls him at two o'clock in the morning. Fred's sound asleep. Oh, he's having a great night's sleep. One of the best nights he's ever had. And his phone's ringing and, and, he, and he picks up the phone and Emily says, sorry to call you, but I'm broke down. I'm scared to death. Can you come help me? And, and Fred says, are you kidding? I'm having a good night's rest. No. Call some, no. What does Fred say? Fred says, be there. Shh. Be there, be there as quickly as I can. Okay, you, you know Fred's going to go out there. He's going to help her, do whatever he can to help her, right? And when she thanks him, you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I'm so glad you called. And we're going to say, are you nuts, Fred? You're glad? <laughs> she called you at 2 o'clock in the morning, woke you? Do you understand why he would say something like that? I know this is hypothetical, but you, you, you get what I'm trying to say? He's genuine. He could say something like that because he's genuinely glad. Why is he genuinely glad that you thought enough of me, mm. that you think that I'm close enough, a brother in Christ, that you can count on me? That that shows closeness. I I think an illustration like that under undergirds this idea. It's not burdensome. That doesn't mean it's not it's not going to be won't be hard. Uh, it, it might be difficult. It might be taxing. But you know what? Deep down. I'm so glad we're in this family together that we can share uh, these these kind of burdens. Uh, uh, Galatians chapter six, verse one: Bear one another's burdens. Right? We're we're, we're here to help each other uh, as we go through trying to live for God. Verse four: For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Born of God. This is like Peter talking about the new birth again. These are not things that we just make a commitment to. We have been born again. And when we were born again, we received the gift of God's Spirit. I think he's bringing this up to remind us 
It's not just our best efforts to love. God helps us. The person of the Holy Spirit indwells us to actually help us do the very things that God wants us to do. And this is the victory that has overcome the... Oh, I love this verse. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, I'm sorry I'm taking so long, but let's, let's, let's do a little review here. This is, this is the way John started off his message, right? The, the entire letter. He starts off by saying, That which we, our hands have handled, that's we, which we have seen with our eyes. Why is he so emphasizing the physical Jesus? Why is he emphasizing that? He, he's talking about Jesus there, and he says, Listen, I'm coming as a witness to tell you not just about Jesus, but I'm telling you that Jesus really did live in history lived a physical life, and died on a, on a physical tree. Why is that so significant? The, the resurrection is what story our faith is based on. Okay, the it, this is a historical truth. And why, it, it, I always find this best to pit it against all the other major world religions. Mm -hmm. All the other major world religions, if, if Buddha, if it turns out Buddha lived a totally different kind of life than what we thought, would that change Buddhism at all? Not at all. Buddhism is not based on the life of the Buddha. It's based on his teachings. And the idea of Buddhism is, you want to be a good Buddhist? Then do this stuff. Have this mindset. Have this worldview. Uh, adopt this philosophy. And insofar as you do that, you're a good Buddhist. Uh, Islam, by the way, is very much like this. If, if Muhammad, if it turns out that you, you know there never was a Muhammad, really wouldn't affect Islam because it's all based on these major pillars and the way you're supposed to live. It's all based on the, you be a moral person, you follow this. Christianity does have morality, but that's not the basis of Christianity. The basis of Christianity is Jesus. It's the life that he lived. You know, for, forgive me, but I, I keep coming back to this image. People say different pathways up the same mountain. Well, all the other world religions, you can say that, and you can make Christianity into that, if you're talking about just being a good person. That's what all the other world religions are. Christianity comes and gives us another mountain. It's the one that Jesus accomplished, right? And so when he says here, this is the victory that overcomes the world. What overcomes the world? Our faith. What is our faith? Our faith is in the fact that Jesus did what we couldn't do. <laughs> Christianity... Sorry, I'm going to start yelling here in a minute. <laughs> Christianity, Acts chapter 17. When the message came to Thessalonica, the Jews in Thessalonica were so upset, they said, these people who have turned the world upside down have come here too. You know why they turned the world upside down? Because they, they brought something that none of the world religions had ever done. It's an alternative to you trying real hard. Your morality. It's God doing it for you. And how do you encapsulate that? Well, you can use the word faith. What does the word faith mean? Trusting belief. He did, he did it for us. And so it's just another way of saying that powerful verse here, I think. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We're, we're focused on what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, since he's done that for us, we are changed people. This is the one, verse 6, it says, this is the one who came by. Who are we talking about here? Our faith in Jesus, right? Okay. What does it mean when it says he came by water? How did Jesus come by water? Okay. When, when he was baptized in the Jordan by John, came by water. What does it mean when he came by blood? Yeah, in all likelihood, when you, if you want to, in broad strokes, talk about Jesus' life, it says baptism through... The cross, death, burial, and resurrection, right? Okay. He's the one who came by water and the blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and the blood. He wasn't just baptized and a great teacher. No, he came and he died and he shed his blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies. How did the God's Spirit testify at Jesus' baptism? Voice. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's a pretty obvious endorsement, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, descends as a dove, and the voice from God is heard. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Spirit testifies. By the way, 
He testified at Jesus' baptism. But all that's recorded for us accurately by the apostles because the Holy Spirit protected the apostles as they wrote these things down. So there's another sense in which the Holy Spirit testifies to this as we read the Bible, right? That's the, that's the word of the Spirit too. Because the Spirit is truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. In agreement about what? Jesus is the one who gets us right with God. Verse 9, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it's, it's the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Whoever believes the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. God does not make people believe. He gives them ample proof. Powerful proof. He gives them a great testimony. But he still allows people to make their own choice. And some won't believe, but you know what? Some won't. Some won't. And they'll deny. And I, I really do think that's what uh, John's talking about there. Verse 11, and this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. Okay, this is all possible because what, what Jesus has done. And John is stepping back and saying here almost the exact same thing he said in the Gospel. Remember at the end uh, of the Gospel, chapter 20, verse 31, he says, why did he write all these things, these signs? Why did he write them? So that you all may believe in Jesus and have life. Yes, there's so many other things that Jesus did. That he could have written, but he focused on these so that people might believe and in believing in Jesus have life, right? What does he say here? He says, I have written these things, those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know you have eternal life. Okay, again, we're talking about that confidence that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. Verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. Can, can, can I say it this way? He, he said, one of the things you look at is the direction of your life. One of the things you look at is love. Love and brothers and sisters. Another thing you can look at in your life is your prayer life. If you, want, if you want to look at your life and try to determine the things you can't see, look at some of the things you can see. One of the things you can see is love. Commitment to people that you can actually see. But here's another thing. We have confidence in approaching God. If we ask anything, there's a qualifier here, according to his will. What does that mean? Uh, even Jesus in the garden, when he prayed, if there's, if there's any way for this cup to pass, what was that final line that, that, that we have in Jesus' prayer? What did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah, not my will, but your will be done. So there, there's a qualifier here. But if it is God's will, you can ask anything. Uh, uh, Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 14. Anything in my name, and you will receive it, as long as it's according with God's will. Uh, by the way, the backside of this, uh, according to James chapter 5, God's waiting for us to pray sometimes. So it's not like, it's not like we're praying about stuff. I'm sorry, this, this kind of bothers me sometimes. Sometimes people look at prayer and they say, well, if you put this kind of qualifier on, if you say it has to be God's will anyway, well, God's will is going to be done anyway. So why bother praying? That's, that's not true. God does, God does have a will, and he wants us to pray within that will, but sometimes he's waiting for us to pray. Uh, what else does he mean when he says, uh, Elijah was a man with a spirit just like ours, and he prayed that it would not rain for three years, three and a half years it didn't rain. Uh, uh, the implication is that would not have happened if, if Elijah hadn't, had not prayed. Okay, and so if you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So it's, it's our prayer life that ought to help indicate that we have that relationship with God as well. Okay, verse 16, here we go. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin... That does not lead to death. Okay, 
I, I want to take verse 16 and 17 together. We'll come back and comment on this. If you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should, you should pray and God will give them life. Uh, by the way, we're going to comment on this in just a second, especially that part that leads to death. But what does that imply when he says that you should pray and God will give them life? What, what does that mean? What does it imply if you didn't pray? You die. It, yeah. Your prayer does make a difference. Now, the, the, the part of these two verses that, that uh, trip a lot of people up, though, is, is this comment about what leads to death. If you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray to God and he will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Okay, so uh, let's put this aside for just a second, the sin that leads to death. He's saying these other issues that our brothers and sisters face, should we be praying about them? Yes. Will our prayer make a difference? Yes. Okay, good. That's his main point. But now I know what everybody wants to talk about. <laughs> is this, this idea of what leads to death. Well, what's the... He does not say he's talking about the unpardonable sin. Mark chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 12 talk about the unpardonable sin. And what is that? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What, what does the word blasphemy mean? It is a spoken sin. And Jesus, by the way, in both Mark 3 and Matthew 12, neither place does he say that they had done it. He warns them. He warns them. And who is he warning? He's warning people who are attributing his power to do miracles they're saying he really got that power from Satan. Okay? That's, he's warning them, saying, you're approaching something where there's no return here. Okay. That's not what we're talking about here. That's Mark 3, John, uh, Matthew 12. He is talking here about a sin that leads to death. What sin leads to death? The only kind of sin that leads to death is sin that's not forgiven. Forgiven sin does not lead to death. Okay, if we're not talking about the unpardonable sin here, if we're only talking about sin that's unforgiven, what kind of sin is unforgiven in your life? Okay. <laughs> sin, unrepentant, <coughs> willful disobedience, turning your back on God, is a sin that is unforgiven. Sin that is unforgiven leads to death. So uh, before we get into the details, can I, can I kind of keep this at a high level? Can I keep this basic? I think he's saying when he talks here about praying for people and it makes a difference, yeah, you can pray for people. Even people when they're involved in sin, it'll make a difference. If they're working with you and working with God and trying to overcome this sin. But if somebody doesn't want to repent of their sin, if somebody's not trying to work on this sin, you know what, that's not a sin that's going to be forgiven. And whether you pray about it or not, I think what he's talking about here is God's not going to violate somebody's free choice. God lets people choose. God offers forgiveness to anybody. Any sin can be forgiven. Any sin, right? It can be forgiven if people would seek that forgiveness. But some people won't. And so in that case, that sin would, would remain unforgiven. Okay. Okay. Parallel passage, I think, is Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 6. We've talked about this before. I think we've got time, so let's flip over there real quick. Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. I hope this is a review. We've looked at this before, but here's what it says. Beginning in verse 4, chapter 6, it says, It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened. What does it mean to be enlightened? Understand. It means you get it. You understand, right? Those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift. What's tasted of the heavenly gift? What does that mean? Doesn't that mean you're saved? Going to heaven? The gift of heaven? Isn't the gift of heaven salvation? Okay, those who have been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit. This, this is the nail in the coffin, I think. 
Because according to Romans chapter 8, verse 9, you can tell the difference to those who belong to God and those who don't by those who have the Spirit of God. So those who have been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted of the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away. It's impossible for these people, even if they have this relationship with God, even if they're, uh, they're part of the redeemed, it's impossible for these people, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance as long as to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Okay, some translations use the word because it's a participle. I think we've talked about this before, but the idea here is as long as somebody turns their back on Jesus. How does it say it here? They are... Uh, what's the verse? Uh, crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. If somebody no longer has, is trusting Jesus but have turned their back on Him and subjecting Him to public disgrace, right? You have turned your back on the only person who can save you. Who is that person? I didn't ask that question very well. Fallen Christian? Okay. What, what I'm trying to say is this. Somebody who turns their back... By the way, the point of the passage is, is there hope for that person? Yes. If, they turn back, if I understand that word back. right, because or as long as, there is hope. What, their only hope is if they come back to Jesus. But the point being made here is there is absolutely no hope. It's impossible for them to come back to repentance as long as they do what? Continually. As long as they turn their back on Jesus. I'm, I'm shorthand here. But subject him to public disgrace and not looking for forgiveness. Isn't that exactly who John's talking about? Who's the person? What's the kind of sin that leads to death? The person who commits the sin and turns his back on Jesus. The only one who can forgive him of his sin. So the willful person who keeps himself out of forgiveness, that's the, that's the one that, you know what? Uh, that's their choice. It's, it's a sad choice. Isn't that the prodigal son? Up until the point he came to his senses. Right. He turned, he came back. That's right. He still it's a great hope, example. But he comes back, but he's kept his back turned, and even went to the big sky. And, you know, if they know family, family, and you're... Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, there's there are just so many passages. Prodigal Son's a great example of this. God will let you do what you want to do. God's giving you a choice, and God lets you make bad choices. He, he gives you every reason to make good choices. But he gives you a free will choice. Uh, um, and uh, sometimes those free will choices that we have lead to death. So, um, uh, I, I, any other questions or comments on that? I, I know I'm kind of doing, uh, skimming the surface here, but I, I just want to give some basic thought. Brian. I think it comes back to our, un, especially this issue of prayer, our inability to understand how it could not be God's will that our marriage is reunited or that a young child doesn't die from the, the disease. You know, we're praying and just assuming, well, it's got to be God's will that they're going to be healed. And we don't understand how can, can God permit that. And clearly there are times when he permits these things. And, and I think our, our inability to understand how that can't be God's will. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very good point. And specifically here, we know we know it'd be better for people to become Christians. We know it'd be better for them to be right with the Lord. So why doesn't God just intervene and make them do that? Well, because God lets them have a choice. And sometimes that hurts, and sometimes we don't like that. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's wrap this up. We've only got a couple more verses here. It's, it says uh, in verse 18, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Doesn't this sound like the way he started off the passage. Uh, God is light in him, is no darkness at all. And, and if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ content, continues to forgive us of our sins. Okay, if we're born of God, he does not continue to sin. It's that pathway again. You, you might slip from time to time, and when you do, we have an advocate with the Father. We have one who, who's a propitiation for our sin, John says. So we know that we are born of God. We do not continue in sin. It's the direction of our life. The one who is born of God, uh, uh, the one who is born of God keeps them safe 
and the evil one cannot harm them. Who's the evil one he's talking about here? Yeah, we know that because look at the next verse. He says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Okay. Uh, we are children of God, so we're excluded from this, but almost everybody else is under Satan's control. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? The whole world. Okay, that kind of sounds like either you belong to God or you belong to Satan. Uh, Satan's happy for people not to catch this. But you're never really your own person. Acting selfishly, being your own person, uh, rebelling against God, you think you're making it. No, you're not. Uh, uh, you're, you're really playing right into Satan's hand. We know that we're children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we might know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, the eternal life. So, in, in another way, it's just re-emphasizing what He said back in chapter 4, verse 4. He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So, there's only two kind of people in the world, those who belong to God and those who belong to Satan. And guess what? We don't have to worry. Satan's not going to be able to overpower us. Why? Because we have the victory that overcomes the world. What is that victory? Not that we're so good and Satan can't get us, but that we have a Savior that's so strong. The whole new mountain, right? It's what Jesus did. It's faith that's the victory. It's trusting Him. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. What is idolatry? What's an idol? Anything that's other than God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anything that anything that takes the place of God. Which which commandment <laughs> of the Ten Commandments? Which commandment deals with idolatry? First two. Say that again. The first two. Ones. That's a perfect way to answer that, Roger. That's exactly right. What was the very first of the Ten Commandments? What does it say? There's only one God. You should have no other gods before me, beside me. Only one God, and it's God. You know what that commandment's really dealing with? Idolatry. Shouldn't have anything else. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Reach <laughs> <laughs> <Man>, <laughs> <Free> on. <laughs> no other guys, what's commandment number two? Okay, specifically. No idols. Don't use any idols in your worship of God. So no graven images. None of that stuff to worship the one true God. Idolatry is really dealt with in both, but it's more dealt with in the first commandment than it is the second commandment. Because only God should be God. And it, what a fitting way for John to close his letter, because the whole letter is all about our confidence, our faith in God. He's the one who gives us the victory that overcomes the world, overcomes the evil one. So why in the world would we ever want to turn to anything else? It's God who makes us right. Okay. Uh, uh, any, any other comments or questions on that? We are not going to go to 2nd and 3rd John. We were just going to do 1st John. Starting next week, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians. Are we meeting next week? Is next week. Uh, Labor Day. Labor Day. Thank you. Are people going to be out of town? Yes. Okay. No. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's decide here tonight, and we'll we'll go ahead and put it in the bulletin. If uh, if a lot of people are going to be gone, we can just wait till it start the following week. Um, we're going to start with Ephesians, and then we're going to do the sister letter. You know what the parallel letter is to Ephesians? No, Galatians is a parallel letter to a much longer one. Yeah, Galatians is a parallel letter to Romans. If you want Romans light, go to Galatians. <laughs> if you want a restatement of the book of Ephesians, you want to read pretty much the exact same thing but written to a different audience, you get the same subject, you look at the book of Colossians. So we're going to look at Ephesians, then we're going to go straight into the book of Colossians and kind of get them side by side. I think that might be kind of fun. So we'll start that two weeks from tonight then. And, uh, Please remind me to uh, make sure the bulletin people get that 
Christmas, Labor Day, next week, I'll forget. Let's pray.